welcome to the Naked Podcaster. Get ready to hear stories of someone brave enough to bear it all. Your past doesn't define you, but it does lead you on a path to today. Let's get naked. Hello and welcome to the Naked Podcaster. Today I have with me Mel Greenberg and we're already laughing, so that's a really good start. How are you, Mel? I'm great. How are you? I'm awesome. Your website is melmediallc.com. And everything will be in the show notes, but tell me everything there is about that. About my website. It is yes. it's a landing space. It's a blog. I highlight authors. I am an author, but I'm also um, a producer and I'm, so it's an opportunity and it's a platform for a lot of my different ventures, all related to um, entertainment and lifestyle and midlife. Well, we're there. I know. Oh, yeah, I'm in the thick of it. <laughs> well, we were, I mean, I'm turning 49 next month in December uh, as we're recording this. So it's, you know, it feels better than I thought it was going to. I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm turning 60 in just a little over a month. And I think I really liked my 50s the best. So embrace the, what's coming. It's an yeah. awesome fucking decade. It really is. But bad and good. I, I think like I came into my own in my fifties. I grew up. <laughs> yeah. Well, that part's true. I also think that when we were younger and we looked at our parents, forties and fifties, it seemed really old and something that you weren't looking forward to. And we're a different generation. I think as we've gotten older, I'm like, Oh, like I still feel great. I actually feel better than I did in my twenties. This mm -hmm. isn't. So I think somehow as a kid, at least for me, I had this expectation of what it would be like, and it's not at all like that. And so I, I just think I'm going to keep having fun. Yeah. Well, I will turning 50 for me was a, a bit of a baggage and I didn't have that reference point. I lost my mom the week before she turned 50. And I was 17. So for me, it was more like, oh, I made it. And I've lived past that point. So perhaps the idea to embrace that, you know, it affected me quite differently. But I, Absolutely. Do I did in my 20s, that's for sure. So you have a blog, you have a bookstore, you really, your website really highlights people. How, how does that happen? How do they find you? And how do they become part of your website? Um, they find me, I've, I've really developed an incredible presence and community, if you will, on and through Instagram primarily and Facebook, um, and then through events that I do. But I have to, the Instagram community with regard to independent authors, which I am one, is absolutely the most embracing, warm, supportive community I've encountered across the board. And so a lot of that and those connections and support has come through those relationships that just keep evolving and growing and kind of exponentially, um, you know, tentacles keep reaching out into other areas. And so I kind of, I'm a work in progress. I think we all are. And the areas change a bit. I like to, my life has been a huge part of, part of it is to support and give back however I can. And, now through the authors, I decided a few months ago, I really wanted to use my blog also, not just to, for my own writings and meanderings, but to, to give other authors and whomever an opportunity to write and, and highlight them. So I do an author spotlight monthly and, and it started out kind of fun. And I'm actually now booked through April, I believe. Um, people reaching out to me for the opportunity to do it. And I, and I love it. And if there's no charge, I just want to give that chance to people. And then I also, each month, the author that I highlight, I put out on all my social media platforms. And um, so that's something that's come. So it's kind of, you know, it's a little bit of everything. I love that you're doing that. We need to talk about that later. Uh, I also love you, you do that. Tell me about, let me look at it. Um, one thing that you say is you, you have a quote on your website that says, without failure, who would you be? Um, which I love. And also it's what I use in a speaking platform and in this online quiz that we created. So I love the thought of if you, if you weren't going to fail, if it was a guarantee, what would you do? And you kind of have that same feeling on your website. I do. That's, it, that's my, 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 my life. It's, it's, um, I have two boys it's what we, my husband, both and I have, have tried to impart to them. Um, 
And one thing I always used to say to my children when they were growing up, just do not accept no for an answer. No is an easy way out. It's lazy. And if you believe in something and you can do it, you might fall on your face, but keep going. You know, aim for yes. Aim for I've got this and, and it will come. So tell me how the website came to be. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> um, and you can go back before that. Usually there's a story oh, before the story. You yeah. Know? Well, the so story, you can take us back. It's kind of, um, I was a radio producer in my previous life. I got married, had children, stayed home, and that was my best job to raise my boys. Um, but when I met my, my soon-to-be husband, he, here in Tucson, he was doing, um, he's a, we have a financial advisory firm and he was, you know, guesting on shows. And I, I suggested that he do a show. So I started producing it and we have, we've had it now for almost 30 years and um, it's streamed on iHeartRadio. It's awesome. And my youngest son, who's 25 is now on the show also in our company, but that entertainment lifestyle, it kind of came out of that. I needed um, a place to have, a lot of people were calling in with questions and different things, and it sort of evolved out of that. And then also through that has become the, the idea that it's many more things. It's not just radio or TV. Um, it's, I, I was a writer, I've gone back to that. So it's become that. So, and it's an acronym and, and a, a friend actually years ago came up with that acronym MEL, which is MEL Media Entertainment Lifestyle. And I loved it and it was just perfect. And I've kept it all these years. I think maybe it was 12 years ago, 10 years ago. And it really was just kind of a place to find me, but it wasn't active and it hasn't really been active until the past few years since um, I wrote and published my first novel. And now that's um, really an important part of, of who and what I'm doing. 30 years. Tell me the name of the show again. Money Matters. Oh, I have actually heard of that. Okay. And you've been in this space f for 30 years. That's phenomenal. Well, the, the, the radio show. Yeah. 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 But yeah, kind of, I guess. Sure. So take me back further because you mentioned your mom passing away when you were 17. Mm -hmm. So it's got to start, your story's got to kind of start somewhere before that. It, uh, uh, yeah, I grew up in San Diego and okay. I had an older brother, 10, 10 years older. And I actually, she got sick when I was 13. And I think that was a pretty pivotal moment. Um, as I actually, it's really only come to light in the past, truth be told, few months, um, that because I was always really outgoing and somewhere along the line and I didn't trace it to those moments I got really shy and I just and I and then I realized I really wanted to be invisible when that happened because I saw people looking at me and I was like oh poor Mel and I just I didn't want any of that I wanted just to kind of go along and be a teenager and so all of a sudden this very outgoing gregarious child was introverted and didn't want any spotlight on her so then my mom died I I had started college actually quite young at 16 and I, because she knew how sick she was. So I transferred to the East Coast um, at 18, 19, 18 or 19, now I don't remember. But anyway, I went to the University of Maryland and really came into my own back there, both in terms of growing and figuring out what I wanted to do. I always thought I would, I actually thought I wanted to be um, in politics and then and probably you know you always get that question what would your dream job be mm -hmm. I don't know if I would say that right now given our current environment but I always thought to be a political speech writer would have been my dream and it was great to go to Washington and I, I followed the media path and I worked in, in radio there and it was in the very early 80s in the beginning of talk radio and it was a really exciting time and I had some incredible mentors and um, then I, but I'm also a West Coast girl, missed the West Coast, came back out this way, thought I was on my way back to California, stopped in Tucson, stayed longer than I thought, met my husband and haven't left. But no, I missed the, I still miss the ocean terribly. And I'm in LA a lot. Our oldest son um, is in the film industry in Los Angeles. So we're out there quite a bit. Your mom got sick when you were 13. I understand you kind of shut down, but mm -hmm. what, what was she sick with? Breast cancer. And you're talking about um, 30 years ago. 40. 
30, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, uh, gosh. Yeah, 1977, so yeah. Um, yeah, and I got it the year before I turned, at 49. And the irony in that is that I remember that what little I do remember because she was very, she kept the, the gravity of it quite private. Um, it was estrogen receptive. And I remembered those terms and that was a terrible thing because she died quite quickly um, within four years. But now that's actually a really good thing. And that is what I had. And I was treated with tamoxifen and I was very blessed. I got early diagnosis. It was very um, low recurrence rate. I mean, if you had to get it, the one I got was awesome and on so many levels. So it was a good thing. So that's how much, and that's what's so tremendous in the how, how, why we have to support cancer research because where it's come, and I have a friend, one of my best friends on this planet was just diagnosed last month. And even within the 10 years since I was diagnosed, where they are, what they're doing, the treatments, the prospects is just so amazing. It, it blows my mind. Because you ha ended up having it at a very similar age to your mom, you must have been tracking yourself pretty closely before then. I did. I started getting mammograms when I was in my late 20s mm -hmm. and just watched it. And um, I actually, so um, a book that I'm a, a global collective that I'm a part of that just launched last week, I, that was my essay. I wrote about what that meant, how I went through that, because I literally spent those years and probably most of my adult life fearing and having anxiety, horrible anxiety, that any little thing I got, that was cancer. I was going to die just like she did. And, and coming to terms with that, but honestly, getting the diagnosis was like, oh, okay, I got it. There's not a damn thing you can do about it. And I put together, so we're just to put this in clarity for everyone. Um, we're a football family and my husband played in college. My youngest son played at Kentucky my older son played lacrosse. So I, I put in terms of everything like a coaching staff and I put together my staff and my team and I was in control and it was the most liberating, empowering moment that I truly felt probably had felt ever. So in the, in the, in the light of all of that, in the darkness was this incredible light that came through. So I, I really, and I, that's what I wrote about. It really, it was a blessing. How much of your mom's story and health history did you actually have to, to base information on? I had it all. I had, and, and, and honestly, um, so we're um, of Russian Italian descent. So, and she was the only female member of my immediately immediate family to get breast cancer. I had done, I had actually got an implant and I got a mammogram every May. And I got implants because I was flat as a board, just something I wanted to do. And so I got them in May. So, you know, you have to wait a certain amount. I couldn't get my mammogram that May, and that was 2009. I had to wait seven or eight weeks longer and got the mammogram in July, which actually her birthday was July 22nd. She died on the 14th to, put, to give you some perspective there. So I get my mammogram. And they find it. And it is so tiny that it was probably, I, be, I be, it's because I got the, the implants. Because had I waited, had I gotten it, it may not have even shown up on my original, had I gone at my original time. And, and I got called the call back and they gave me my diagnosis. Well, that, what, what they knew was, was to be the, the future on actually July 22nd, which would have been our 82nd birthday. Um, and so what, I forgot your question. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might have too. Huh? <laughs> oh my God. Well, you um, had a lot of, you had all of her health history oh, her is health what history. I was asking. No, so, okay. So that was it. Thank you. Circle back squirrel. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I, I, I was prepared to have a double mastectomy. I don't care. They weren't mine anyway. I thought oh, maybe I'll go bigger. Who the fuck cares? So I did the BRCA testing and they did the two, they did first the Ashkenazi Jew, Jewish testing. Didn't have it. Then they did a broader spectrum testing. Didn't I don't have the gene. So I opted, I just did a lumpectomy. So I did have a tremendous amount of her health. And we had very different health. She, she was not a healthy child. She had severe asthma, which almost killed her on several occasions in her youth. And so she overcame that. And But other than that, she, I guess the cancer was the worst thing. So, you know, I, I did have those things. And, and I just, even if you don't have a history, I just would impart to anyone watching or listening to this to, to, to see your doctors every year.
because the early diagnosis is what saves it matters every yeah it does that month a week a day matters it does and i my aunt had um breast cancer and on my mother's sister but i started getting mammograms early and i'm not sure why that was the case exactly but i got breast augmentation also um i don't know why they thought i was a higher risk or but i started getting them in my early 30s and then i had breast augmentation when i was 32 and but they did mammograms on me prior to the augmentation did they not do one right before because yours was with just within a year no because it was not yeah and it wasn't even any yeah, because i did have yeah them. and i had such a i had you know what they're almost a 30 year history of having them so there and there were there were no irregularities there you know there were no issues so yeah. And it's it's scary even if there's not a history because we hear so much about it. I ended up having, you know, I had augmentation for probably almost 10 years, but I was getting mine done every single year and they found two lumps in my left breast. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as you know there's something going on, you're, of course, it's devastating. You're terrified. Mm -hmm. And they did the ultrasound and, and for, for six, every six months I had to go in and get that done. Mm -hmm. And I was, I felt blessed. So share with me your experience on this. The radiologist got up out of his chair in the, I always think of them as like the wizard of Oz, you know, they're like back behind the curtain. <laughs> in my mind, the radiologist is a wizard of Oz. He came into the room, they did the ultrasound and I was still laying there. And he came into the room on that first ultrasound and said, I just want to talk to you and touch base with you right now. And I swear to God, it was the best medical experience I've ever had because he took five minutes out of his day to immediately come and just have a conversation with me. So I didn't wait three days to hear back from my doctor after the radio. I mean, oh it's God. such a and cluster. And emotionally, that's so important because oh. the, the, the questions and, and the worst case scenarios that build up in you waiting for those answers is, is just awful. It, so it is. And he came in and he said, look, this doesn't look like cancer. We have to watch it every six months. Mm -hmm. And I don't want you to worry about, I want you to try not to worry about it because it doesn't have any markers. I don't know what it is. I don't know what these two lumps are mm -hmm. and you didn't have them last year, but I'm also not super worried about it. And when I went back in six months, he said, nothing's changed. You know, he came right back into the room. I had the same, re I was so blessed in that part of it. And when they hit the, the 18 month mark, he's like, we're going to check it one more time at the two year mark. Nothing's changed. Good Do you enough. want them removed anyway? And I said, well, if it's nothing, why would I want them removed? And he said, a lot of women are so uncomfortable at having anything there, like a foreign object that they want the surgery to remove. It. And I'm like, I don't want an unnecessary surgery for no, re like they're fine. I'm so glad to hear you say that because that is such a, a so much of that is happening currently and 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 young women and, and any age really are thinking it's a great preventive measure and my oncologist when we talked about it and she's at the time she had been involved in every major breast cancer study worldwide for the then past 25 years brilliant woman and she after i made my decision because it's a very personal decision she told me that she was glad and she told me why that she said you know mel there's not a wall where then we know, okay, it's all gone. Little cells could be hiding somewhere. So you're, you're thinking you're doing something that's really good and you have a false sense of security and it could still happen. And how devastating would that be? Right. And I just think it's important to know that no matter what, it's, there is no hundred percent cure of anything, which was kind of my, my takeaway from the whole thing, all the worrying I did, everything, no matter what, we don't know what we get the next day. We don't know what's coming, but we do know, and what we can control is how we deal with what comes. I just knew that they were there and they weren't doing any harm and I didn't need to be cut on. I also, when I first, when it first happened though, and I had the mammogram and they told me that they found something and I needed to go to ultrasound, it, it was only three days from that. And it was, those were agonizing days, but yeah. I knew immediately I would get a double mastectomy. Okay. And and maybe I wouldn't have, but in my mind, I was like, I want to wipe out. I just remove them, just take them. And I had already had augmentation. I'd already had right. pregnancies. Oh, I'd already cool. like, yeah. who the hell cares? Exactly. So I'm going to draw on my nipples or whatever. I like, I just didn't yeah. care. Totally and I just thought if this is, if this is malignant, I am going to go 
as, as aggressively as I can to combat it because I'd rather have no boobs and be right. alive. You do what and, you can. Right. And, and so then, and, and then on the flip side, when it was benign, I was like, ah, now leave them. And so every year I like wave hide my two little lumps. Well, and that's how I was completely prepared. Had, had I had that gene, it, it didn't bother me. It didn't, it wasn't a question. I'm like, take them. Yeah. Take them. It means nothing to me. It's not who I identify with. I like no. having them the size they are with the augmentation, but if they were gone, it's not who I am. So I did, yeah. I did I could care less. I, I would have done the same thing. I would have yeah. been like, hey, take the implants out, take the breast, put the implants back in basically. Yeah. And like, yeah. see you later. Have a yeah. good one. It was yeah. no, so that part of it was no big deal. And I wonder how many women really completely lose some of their, I, I can understand that because I also had a hysterectomy and I felt like, okay, if I have a hysterectomy and then I lose my boobs, there's nothing about, was what that, about me. Was female. That driven hysterectomy or a choice? I lost twins at 19 weeks. And so it, I, it was, it was three surgeries. So it had nothing to do with, um, potential cancer or anything like that. It was, yeah, I was, my body, that was done, You're but done. I can understand from that experience, women who decide to have the mastectomy feel less female or have some sort of emotion around that. But it's great to hear that was not your issue. It was certainly not my issue. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and as I said, it's a very, very personal and should be yes. a personal decision. And I loved that uh, regardless of their expertise and medical and all, everything that they allowed me the space to work through that myself and make the decision that was right for me. I mean, they guided me, they gave me, every ounce of every scenario that I could have so that I could make an educated choice that was right for me. And, and that's ultimately what matters too, because then you have the comfort. Again, it comes back to some sort of control in a situation that you have no control over. So I knew that this was right for me and these are the things I'm doing and this is me going forward and I'm happy with me. And if it's a year, if it's a, you know, a decade, if it's another 50 years, you know, whatever I, I'm given on this planet, I'm happy with those decisions and that's a good place to start. I'm also glad that you did, even though, like, if it were my mom compared to me, like her health, her health is, was worse than mine for lots of reasons, you know, so it, it's still not the same, but just to have that information kind of moving forward, um, to see if there are similarities. And it's so great to see how much medicine has changed in that 40 year time span. Yeah. What a gift to see that. Tell me more, a little bit more though about the anxiety you had in the waiting, because that would be agonizing. Which, which, which waiting? <laughs> the, what, wondering, like every time you get sick, it's the cancer, which we joke about in our family. I've, I've banned everyone from WebMD and because it doesn't matter what you put in there. I swear to God, no matter what you put in there, oh, you know, you're either overtired or you have cancer. And you, have, you, you, you plan your graves. Yeah, I, <laughs> your graves. like no web MDs allowed. So yeah. tell me about, you knew that this was a very high likelihood from your mom. So that anxiety in those years of every time you got sick. I, it was, yeah, it, and it got, it was, it was the worst in my twenties. And it's because I think then I just didn't have the, the resources or the knowledge or the what I don't know what the, the the experience the life experience to to think through it all at the, you know that point you're you're on to 50 million things at once and building your life and your career I it consumed me I would you know hand sweats just just absurd now I look back and it's absurd it's like why didn't I deal with this and I mean I would get a headache and I'd be in the doctor I have a, I'm sure I had a brain tumor so every little thing I immediately went to the worst possible case it could be. And I, you know, I think part of it was part of me wanted it to be because then I, I would just like, cause I was also had probably some on some level convinced myself that my mother's fate was going to be mine. Mm -hmm. And so if it's going to happen, just let it happen and, and be gone. But then when I had children, the anxiety shifted. Number one, I didn't ever want my life over because I wanted to be there for all my kids' milestones and to see them grow and, and all the things that happened in their lives. So the the attention and the want of my life shifted. But then the other side of that is it was anxiety because oh my god, what if I'm not here for my son's graduation or the wedding or the grandchildren and you know so it just took a long time and I it's sad to say for me it really was getting it that like released me 
from all of it. I don't worry about things. I mean, and it is, it, I think it's all control. And I think I felt like I had no control at such a young age mm -hmm. that I worked through my adult life looking for control. Even if it was bad, I would make bad choices in my life, but I was the one doing it. So it was all good. And that's a really jaded perception, but it's, it's, it was accurate. Um, and I think now I look at and I see what I can do with that need for control. And my control is my response. So it, it absolutely shifted. And I feel like every fiber in my body is more relaxed. And I'm a pretty hyper Wow, person anyway. So to have that on any level is is empowering for me and calming. And and I do do meditation and I and I work a lot in that area for me. And even I find that hard. <laughs> it's like, like, sure. That's like the hardest for me. <laughs> totally I gotta tell you. What? I, that's the hardest for me. I know. I'm I, just like, <laughs> I imagine also because you were a 17 year old kid who lost your mom and you had shifted your attitude and behavior because of everything that was going on. There would be, for me as a mom, I would think, I don't want to put my kids through that. What you had gone through with losing your mom and her being yeah. sick. Yeah. It was, um, well, well I, so I don't know if I would like put, the, cause I, you, I knew, I mean, you, you, I don't have, I didn't want it to happen. I was praying every day that I wouldn't, have that that wouldn't be part of our family story that they would have to be motherless but again you can't control it if it happens so i so i would worry about that a lot and that worry is not healthy um and i'm yeah. sure that that comes up that came up in a lot of personality reactions and and responses to things just that constant you know again that constant worrying and now i i for the most part i don't worry about anything it's just like bring it on let it happen um, and I also, I really do look at even like the worst things that have happened in my life. I are good things because I'm here and I'm who I am now. So it would all be different if those things didn't happen. So I, it's, it's a choice to how to proceed, you know, how to get through things and look at things. And I think that's really important. And that's important to me, keeping a positive mindset you know, to, to think that way. I understand completely how you said that when you were diagnosed with it, it's like, okay, we're, we're here. And then you actually felt like you had more control over the situation. Cause now the monster under the bed, you can confront it. Yeah. Right. And you put together your team. So go into a little bit of that for me. Um, I, 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 sought out we're, fortunately I'm, I'm in tucson arizona and the arizona cancer center here is is world renowned so i was very lucky to have that at my back door mm -hmm. and so that i could be here getting the best care and still with my family and it was important to me to have the doc the surgeon the oncologist the radiologist they were not all in the same networks, like, you know, which they don't always like. They want to play with each other. They don't want to have people from other hospitals or medical centers working with you. And, and that didn't matter to me. This was my journey and they were going to have to play by my rules. And I, I needed to know that I felt comfortable and I could address any one of them at any time with my questions and everything so whatever they were i felt comfortable and i think that's really important whatever your whoever your doctor is you don't just accept that what they say or that this you have to feel comfortable and safe at whatever level that is for you it's different for everybody so i felt really i felt really really good with the group i put together i will share with you though for like all that was awesome and even going through it and it was seven and a half weeks of radiation and it was the months after that I really felt the letdown because leading up to that, again, I was in, in acting mode and I was a producer. So I'm used to putting the shows together, you know, this is this, da, 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 da. And all of a sudden I was back to, you almost feel like, well, I'm not doing anything. Is it, now what? Is it going to come back? Or if I don't eat right, or if I don't, do, you know, so I had to really like step back and, and address that. And, and that's probably what I didn't do or would not have done prior um, in the same way was to be able to step back and look and not just like freak out in the middle of it and, and 
go blindly through all of it. I stepped back from the situation, thought, okay, this is what's happened. This is what I've done. Logically, these things are at play and this is what I need to do. But it took a few months to get to that, that place of, of calmness. And, and that was like a letdown. I thought it was like the post-wedding letdown. Like you have the big buildup and then the day after the wedding, you're sick because all of a sudden I can fucking breathe again. Right. I could fucking breathe again. And I was scared to breathe. It's like, now what do I do? <laughs> like, well, I imagine it consumed a lot of your time and thought and energy yeah, and life. Absolutely. And then it's done. I mean, even on a smaller scale, because we're recording the week of Thanksgiving and like three days of prep for 20 minutes of eating and then it's done. And you're like, what, what was that? And that's just Thanksgiving. Yeah. So that's a great I, analogy. That's exactly right. And that's exactly how I felt. It's like, you know, there's what, six months of buildup and then, yeah. Yeah. And, and that was scary. Yeah. Cool. It was scary for me. Tell me about the radiation and I be, and forgive me because I haven't gone through cancer. I don't know the difference why they use chemo sometimes and radiation other times. And what, what was the process for that? What happened through that? Well, it, it, it depends on, on your diagnosis mm -hmm. and the type of cancer. And, and when you talked about not going online, I, I laughed to myself because my brother's wife <gasps> was diagnosed four years before I was, and she actually had triple negative and went, went just had a really hard struggle through it she's think this is 15 years later she's safe in complete remission which is a blessing but she, the, the advice she goes the only advice i'm gonna give you is stay the fuck off the internet yeah because that is not your friend at three o'clock in the morning you're gonna start googling and you're gonna not even want to get out of bed and so i i held to that i didn't i just trusted them you know my doctors and um any research that they gave me to look at and familiarize myself with um, but so it depends on the kind I, my diet, my can, my specific cancer, um, which actually I guess was treated with because chemo is chemical. I did take tamoxifen. So to some extent that, that is a form of chemotherapy and I, I hope I'm not offending doctors by saying it wrong out there, but, um, I did that for, I did it originally for five years and then based on all of my markers and my, my diagnosis, um, there had, they've shown, um, that another five years reduces your rate of recurrence even further. And I was a candidate to do that. And about, it was two years in, so I would have been, I was on it seven years. I, I asked, I, I sat down with my oncologist and discussed everything because I kind of felt that what difference is it making at this point now, seven years in? And if I didn't need to be on, I just didn't want any more foreign bodies in my body like that. And I did go off of it at seven years. And um, so the, the radiation uh, was seven and a half weeks and it was, they do, because I had the implants, it was uh, half, uh, maybe another week than normal um, because they have to do it just a bit differently. And that, again, that's probably different now. That was 10 years ago. What happens? What are the side effects of the radiation? Did you lose hair? Did you get I sick? Didn't, no, I didn't. And I, I was, I didn't have, and, and I didn't have any side effects from the tamoxifen either. And I was just about going, I was in definitely in perimenopause and probably starting to go into menopause and that kicked me into it. So I never really went through it. So that was an upset. Oh, <laughs> major silver lining. Lucky. <laughs> all that bullshit. And, um, I, I, I really did. I was, I was a poster child for that. And I was, I was very lucky. And, and there's a, there's a slight, um, indentation where the the surgery was and and I can you know the discoloration of the skin um, but that's it not I mean much. that's that I don't want to sound rude but that's almost a letdown compared to the 40-year buildup or you know I know right <laughs> I know well so and and the anxiety and that's that's my point it's like we yeah. can worry every day about and whatever's going to happen is going to happen and it's how you deal with it and when my youngest son, his senior year of high school, was going through the recruiting process to play football, he was having, you could see it, I, I could see it in him, the, you know, the anxiety. And I finally sat him down. My husband's like, you got to talk to him because you, 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 you deal with this. And I said, you, you know what I went through for 49 years of my life, well, roughly, worrying, fretting. And then it happened. And what did I do? And he's like, you took care of business. And I said, right. So sit back take care of business because wherever you go, if it's right, it's right. If it's not, you go somewhere else. It's all going to be okay. And it was great to see him start to process that at, at 
18 yeah. instead of 48, you know, and, and I see now how he is at 25 and, and dealing with his life in that regard and not feeling those things or working through them much more quickly and not allowing them to, to because it, it just builds up. It's like one little thing. And then if you don't deal with that, then there's another little thing. And then all of a sudden you've got, instead of one little hurdle to climb over, you've got these mountains that just take so much work to get through and get over them. My husband is this personality. So he's the guy that's like, you know, um, this is my symptom. And I'm like, it's the cancer, you know, and if the, if the man ever gets cancer, I'm going to feel like shit. But like every time I'm like, we should go on, look at these huts in Bora Bora that are on the water. And he's like, we'll probably get eaten by sharks. And it's like, it's become the biggest joke. So I don't remember how, but now I, I was like, we should go on a cruise. And, it, and he looked at me and I said, there's no sharks in the bathtub. So that's the saying now, like, yeah. like when he gets sick and it's, it's not like he's some whiny anxiety ridden guy. I don't want to paint the wrong picture, but he is, some people go to what could be the worst case scenario. And he watched his dad die of cancer, you know, and his, his wife died. And so I understand that there There's is some, no way that doesn't. Right. I understand. There's some natural fear that goes yeah. along with some of that history. So now every time I'm like, we should go on a hike in the middle of the Mayan, you know, it's like there's panthers. I'm like, God, there's no fucking sharks in the bathtub. We just, people are not dying on the Mayan trail these days, well, you know? Okay, but back up. Cause there are some, there are some things that are just like, I live in the desert. Tucson's gorgeous. I, yeah. I, I, I'm not going to lie. I love the California coast much better, but People come here from all over the world to hike. It's magnificent. I live in the foothills. Beautiful. You can't pay me enough fucking money to hike anywhere. My friends say, let's go for a hike. I'm like, no, because there's snakes. I, I have a beautiful German shepherd. I go where I can take her. There's no way I'm walking through my neighborhood because there's bobcats, there's snakes. There's like, no, not happening. So <laughs> you two aren't allowed to discuss any vacation plans. So that's, <laughs> that's I know, really. <laughs> you and my husband will be on the cruise with wine, and your husband and I will yeah. be at the dock. <laughs> yes, yeah, like bye. <laughs> There's no sharks in the bathtub, but yeah. it is, I mean, I understand that there is a lot of anxiety over things yeah. that you've watched family members go through and struggle yeah. with. And it's, it is nearly impossible emotionally, logically, it might not make sense, but emotion and logic don't play yeah. well in the sandbox. And it's nearly impossible to separate yourself from that anxiety from the past yeah. situation. So good for you for getting through that and then helping your son get through that. Yeah, that felt that felt like one of my best parenting moments. I just, I mean, I'm, 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 my, my son, my oldest son's 27. He's getting married in May. Dylan just turned 25, and I'm, I'm so blessed and I'm so proud of my kids. But that was one of those moments when, I'm like, okay, I got, it. <laughs> did it. Yeah. Well, You're like, where's the recorder? Where's the camera? The camera should be here. I know, right? I'm yes. Stars. Yes. Or big diamonds. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Now you've talked about your website, but you're a published author. Mm -hmm. I want to, this is a fiction book. It is. But based on some reality. Yes. Tell me how you, you were in this um, sort of genre for a lot, for most of your life in one capacity or the other, the media mm -hmm. sort of genre. Mm -hmm. And you launched this website and to take me through your cathartic process of transitioning in life because you have cancer and you also have kids moving out yeah so that all happened it was the perfect storm of shit it happened my oldest son senior year of high school and then he went off to school and went to la to to be to work in film which is, has always been his passion i still have dylan at home who's now going to be a sophomore and then that went into his and then he left and we're very close. We have a great relationship. It was not a helicopter parent, but we have, and, and, and it's what it shows today. We were, were great friends today with them as adults. And so it was great from that perspective, but all of a sudden, every single thing about my life changed. When Dylan went away to college, it was building up. I was getting through my cancer. I had turned 50, all these things. Again, it just, just shit show at once. And I, was really really lost and I hate I didn't and even back that wasn't that long but that was 2013 the 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 conversation about being an empty nester in midlife was not what it is today so I didn't you know I didn't really think of it in those terms it's just like okay my kids are gone 
I didn't know. I didn't process it. Like, what do I do now? And, and clearly that's what I was going through. I, I was really lost. I didn't like, do I go back to work? Do I, what do, who am I? Who am I now? And I lost the job I had had for the past 20 years and I, and I didn't want them back. I mean, I fly little angels. They were off on their way, which is exactly what I, you know, hope and what you pray for, for your children. And I, I tried different things, none of which worked. And because I was just reaching and grasping at things and, and, and doing things I wasn't experienced in or, um, because I didn't wait. And that was, you know, I didn't step back and take the time to really think through it all. And that's, that's kind of what I'm working on now at 60 (laughs) growing up. But, um, I, it came back and in, I guess it was maybe 2015, my husband, we were actually in Italy and he said, and, and he was very sweet. We, and we went through a hard time. Marriage went through a very difficult time. And, and one thing I explained to my children was that because they didn't understand either. It's like, who are you, mom? Like, what, what the, where the hell did our mom go? And nothing about his day-to-day changed. He didn't love his children any less, and I don't love them anymore, but his life stayed exactly the same, other than the fact that he coached them in football. Maybe he was there with them physically, but his, you know, nine to five didn't change. Every single thing about my life changed, and I had no fucking idea what to do with those changes or about them or who I was supposed to be and the people I became or the person I became I didn't like Mm -hmm. and I wasn't happy with and I don't think that I served myself my family or my friends well at all during that period but I was I stepped back again and 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 with my husband's help and I will give him credit on this because he stood by my side through it all and and finally said, don't take this the wrong way. I know the I know this culture we live in, and he's a very he's a New Yorker, and he's a very traditional old athletic boy. And and he's like, you don't have to work. You 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 can stay. You you know. And that's a, and I'm blasting that. And so he said, please don't take that the wrong way. I'm not telling you not to, but because you don't have to hurry up and get out and help us survive every day, do what you love. And you know, my entire life I've been a writer. That was what I studied in school in a different way. I did it after school in radio and television. And he's like, right. And then he kind of, in his New York way, said, why don't you write about all this fucking shit you've gone through? And I'm like, oh. <laughs> oh. So that then, and then, and, you know, and clearly, I mean, it wasn't about ever writing a memoir. I am, that just, for many reasons, was not what I thought my journey would should be. But I really started to look around. And my kids thought there a lot of their friends' parents were getting divorced. Mm. And I think it was, it was, I think it was my older son asked me, you know, why that is at this time when, you know, just now the kids are off and you should be happy. And now you have each other, everyone's leaving each other. And I really thought about that and how, you know, you've got, regardless of how many children you have, you have three members of a marriage, of a family, the kids and the spouses. And when one of those parts is changes, the whole dynamic changes. So do you get back to the relationship? So I started kind of for a good year, really kind of just observing and talking to people and seeing, you know, their journeys and what they're going through. Those that did get divorced, those that got separated and got back together, those that stuck together, worked at, you know, different um, parts of of the journey. And through that, the characters kind of started to come to life. And in my little head, that's always full of voices. (laughs) And um, I started really doing the outline and kind of figuring out and knowing what I wanted to do in 2016. And I, I actually started, sat down, said, I'm doing this and wrote the book. I started in January, 2017, finished the manuscript in May, gave it to my husband on his birthday and public, I published it. I created a publishing company and did that myself. And it has been the most incredible. I published it last, just a year ago, I, I launched it and it's been mind-blowing and it started out originally as a trilogy and I, I knew what that trajectory was I knew what the three books were but through the course of the early reviews and the early responses to the story women and men were so invested in Samantha and what she was going through and wanted to see her at different stages mm. and I did a book club appearance a few months ago with a group of women I think m- probably the youngest was 69 Okay. And they all had the same response. They, and it was, they were just so fun. And we had such great conversation. And they're like, we want, we want to see what Samantha in 10 years, 
We want to know, you know, how she, cause we're going to tell you what we've gone through, but we, you know, so we really want to watch her grow because it's awesome and we want to see her. So then I thought, you know, this is, this is really more about a story of evolution and growth and life at this time in our life that, you know, it's not over that part of it. Our youth, if you will, is over, but we've got this entire beautiful empty road in front of us. What are we going to do with it? And how are we going to, who are we going to become as we travel along? So it's, um, that's how I, I did turn it into a series and I'm just in the middle of, of book two and, Yay! Yeah, and it ends, um, very distinctly and ready, you know, kind of a cliffhanger. And we catch up with Samantha two and a half years after. And, and that's the start of the next book. So that's, that's kind of how that came. And, and, and she, I mean, I think every writer will tell you, of course, there's bits and pieces of them throughout, you know, woven through anything that, that they put on the page. But um, she really is a, a mosaic of so many people I know, myself, experiences, male and female, um, and, and that was really fun too. I got such great feedback from men and it's definitely, it's, it's steamy. There's a, this particular, this book has, because it was, they go through, she goes, it takes place over seven days in Italy and she goes there with an agenda and she's prepared to leave. Then he throws a wrench into it and, you know, confesses some things. And so sex was really kind of the glue that got them through. It was really integral to the story. And um, it's not as much a part of the second book because it just didn't, doesn't belong in it in the same way. She's still Samantha. And so there's that. <laughs> but, so she likes her fun. Um, but it's, and yeah, it's been fun. I love it. I love how it's put together. And, you know, I'm an author, so I know what it takes to get through just the process. I would love to know when I wrote my book and I finished it, I was like, Oh my, it's so, pr you're so like, you did it. Right. And yeah. there's 85% of people who want to write books that don't. Right. And so, I was like, I want to help all of them. And you actually started a publishing company. I did. It's, um, and I, I didn't even really realize that. I just thought, okay, I'm going to do this myself. And, and, to, and, and in part, because I'm fortunate enough that, um, Dean is the financial guy and the numbers guy because I'm so not. And, and we really sat down together and looked at this as a business. And, and whatever comes from it, I, I was going to be so happy. Again, I did it. I wanted to write this. I did it. But then for me, to main, I really wanted to maintain my control of it. Mm -hmm. And I like marketing. I like connecting. I like doing those things. So there were so many different elements at play that, that it was the right choice for me. But in doing that, I, I really wanted, I also wanted a professional piece. It wasn't a vanity book. And, and so I, I joined the IBPA. I, you know, I did a lot of things to, to create this. And I was at a conference last year and I went to a seminar of high, of a, with a hybrid publisher and I'm, and they're going through everything. I'm like, oh, that's what I am. <laughs> like I had, so I don't, you know, I have all these elements and these resources now in my library, if you will, that I am helping other authors get their work to, to market. And it's really fun. The marketing is the hardest and the worst part in my mind. So anybody who's good at that part should do it because I was good at the, what's the next step and how many steps are there and how do you put these steps together so that you actually, cause I, when I was going through it, you don't know what, you don't know to ask questions. Right. right. And I'm like, okay, now it's the ISBN and now it's a library of Congress. And now I have to format. And then there, I was like, how many more, the next step are there in this pro like how many things are there that you have to do? It's not just writing the book. It's all of those. That was steps. the easy part. <laughs> Yeah. Well, kind of. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, I joke about that, but it's true. I, I mean, I don't want to discourage people out there who are in the writing part thinking, oh shit, if this is the easy part, I'm screwed. It's just that you don't know what you don't know. And I loved learning the process, but the mar once, once I got it written and I got through all those things, the marketing, that's a totally different animal. That's where mm. I fell off the map. I, I have no, I had no idea. So I just think when you're really good at things, you should help, you should do them because yeah. other people really aren't. Yeah. And it is, it is time consuming. I do. I'm not going to lie. I it's, it's, 
all encompassing and yeah. a bit overwhelming at times. And I really sometimes just want to sit back and write, but I also know I've got to do both. And so I make a, you know, more, you know, allocate time to, to do both. Um, but it does take a lot of time, but it's fun. And I, I, I was at an, a, an event in the Hamptons in July or June. And, and I, I looked around and I was, t that's when I met Patricia and I was looking around and I thought, if this is all it's, I mean, of course, everyone wants to, you know, have the big, success and, and I'd be lying if I said I were any different but if this is all it is if this is what it's meant to be and that I get to go out in the communities in different communities and talk to women and meet people and share experiences and in any way positively impact somebody else's life then I won the game it makes me so happy to get to do that so you know, but for anyone listening, it's, a, I wanted to go to TV. <laughs> that's my dream. That was, that's my like perfect scenario that this, you know, goes to limited series would be my dream come true. Which would be great. You've had several appearances. Did you kid her? Huh? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but you're the one with friends. Problems, so let's just go there. <laughs> Um, you, uh, you really get involved with book clubs. I want to point that out because that is, I think that would be like the most fun as far as having an author and doing marketing to actually hang out with people who oh are. My God, it is so much fun. Okay. The first one and the first one I did was not only a pinch me moment, but it was surreal because I was sitting in a room with, um, 15 people that I knew one was a sorority sister in, in outside Maryland in outside DC and she brought together her book club but all these women I didn't know and they were discussing and debating my character's actions and motivations and behavior and and it was just surreal it's like they they gave her life in a way that I had not and it was it was fabulous and it was fun to really I mean some of the women really got they were really on opposite sides of their thoughts on Samantha's actions. And I loved hearing, you know, both perspectives. So it, it is a lot of fun. And virtual book clubs are great with Skype. Yeah. You know, I'm in my little house in Arizona and I'm talking to people halfway around the world and it's awesome. So much fun. And now you are part of a collaboration of another book called Chaos to Clarity. And mm -hmm. that's released, was released November of 2019. <clears throat> Last week. Yes, last week as we're as we're taping it was last week. Yeah, sorry. And you are writing the book two in the kind of the series about Samantha mm -hmm. and highlighting other authors and helping people publish. You do ghostwriting also. So what's next? Um, I am working on working with two people. We're we're working on a um a midlife platform. And um it's, it's, it's something I'm really excited about. And when I wrote the book, I, I knew that, that things would come that were unexpected, but that were part of it. And I, I, cho I, said, I made a promise to myself that I would be open to whatever revealed itself along this way. And where I find myself now is connecting with, um, there are some really profound midlife bloggers out there. And I, I would really say over 50, because there's, there are also different, you know, like we don't have we're not, it's not the mommy and me's and they have a really important voice. But for those of us that are past that, um, there it's, it's cool. And I, and I, I can't say a lot more because it's in the, it's in the development stages, but I'm really excited about it. Mel, thank you so much for sharing your story and your journey and your life with us. This was really fun. Thank you. I'm so glad to meet you all and, and happy, happy holidays and to 2020, my God, a new decade. Oh my God, a new decade. Can you believe this already? Yeah, it's a blast. <laughs> well, I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I gotta say I'm liking it. I, I wrote my newsletter for the end of the year about a new decade, a new year. And for me, it's a new decade. I'm going from 50 to 60. It's a new decade in, in, on the calendar and it's a brand new year, a new start over. So cheers. Cheers. <laughs>